Hello, and welcome to today's Ask the Experts webinar, Screen Extremes, Children and Digital Addictions. I am Chris Perry, Executive Director of Children and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. Just last week, we hosted a webinar about smartphones, and the most common questions were about excessive screen time and what to do if a child becomes addicted to their phone. That is precisely what we are going to learn more about today. How do you know when device use has become problematic? Is tech addiction real? As a caregiver or educator, what can you do when you start to notice signs of dependence? Today, you'll hear an expert panel of child and adolescent psychiatrists, researchers, and even a parent with lived experience. Together, they'll discuss tips for assessing children's media use, prevent prevention strategies for digital addiction and best practices and treatments for helping youth who have developed an unhealthy and damaging relationship with digital media. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Mark Potenza. Dr. Potenza is a board certified psychiatrist with subspecialty training in addiction psychiatry. Currently, he is an Albert E. Kent Professor of Psychiatry, Child Study, and Neuroscience at the Yale University School of Medicine, where he is the director of the Yale Division of Addiction Research, the Center of Excellence in Gambling Research, the Women and Addictive Disorders Corps of Women's Health Research, and the Yale Research Program on Impulsivity and Impulse Control Disorders. He is on the editorial boards of 15 journals, including Editor-in-Chief of Current Addiction Reports and has received multiple national and international awards for excellence in research and clinical care. He has consulted to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, National Registry of Effective Programs, National Institutes of Health, American Psychiatric As Association, and the World Health Organization on matters of addiction. He has also participated in two DSM-5 research workgroups and six annual WHO meetings relating to internet use and addictive behaviors in the ICD-11, addressing topics relating to gambling, gaming, impulse control, and addiction. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for having me and organizing this, and delighted to have a, a very uh, diverse and um, well-established panel of individuals here to present on this topic. Uh, First, uh, our first panelist several years ago, um, Elaine Oskowski, uh, faced one of the biggest crises of her life when she learned her youngest son, Jake, was addicted to video gaming. She chronicled her experiences in her book, Seeing Through the Cracks, and now shares her powerful message of hope and awareness through her work as a coach for parents and families and as a speaker. Elaine's second book, Cyber Sober, a Caregiver's Guide to Video Game Addiction, has now also been published. She is a Canada Clinical Partnership Specialist for Intenta Clinical Training for Gaming Disorder and has been featured by many media outlets, including CTV W5, CBC's The National, McLean's Magazine, CHCH TV, Global News, National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, and CBC Radio. So she is here to present uh, on the topic of lived experience with uh, a child's gaming disorder. Thank you for the introduction, Mark, and thank you to everyone who is here joining us today. My story began on October 31st, 2014, when I received an SOS email from my then 19-year-old son, Jake, who was attending university uh, an hour away from where we lived. He was living in residence. And although I say that this letter came as a shock, it also didn't because I'd had this spidey sense that something wasn't right with my son. I just couldn't put a finger on what it was. And he was in trouble and he was very fragile sounding in the letter. I know it was difficult for him to confess, but he had not been attending classes for two months. He instead had been holed up in his residence room. He'd been gaming up to 16 hours a night until he would literally pass out. 
And then in the morning he would wake, sorry, <laughs> not in the morning, he would sleep all day. And then that night he would wake and start that process again. The university caught up with him and they had said that the locks were being changed in his dorm and that uh, he had three days to move out. So he reached out to me. And my first reaction was, thank goodness he trusted me enough to reach out because I know he could have made a different decision. And so I picked up the phone and I said, what do you need? Of course, he burst into tears and said, I want you to make this okay. Tell me this will be okay. I said I would. I didn't know what that was going to look like. I got in my car and I drove to the university and it was the longest hour of my life. He sounded so fragile in the email and he sounded so fragile on the phone that I thought he might take his life in shame before I got there. When I arrived, he opened the door and I opened my eyes. There stood my six foot two son and he had dropped to 127 pounds. He had facial tics, he had tremors, his eyes were dilated, his skin which was normally squeaky clean was a mess of acne, his hair was greasy, he'd been wearing the same clothes for days and days and he smelled horrific and he looked terrible. My heart broke. I just hugged him and hugged him and hugged him. We both cried so much. And then I brought him home. And a lot of things were unraveled as we came home. And I started realizing that the video gaming was a problem. I'd seen signs before he left for university and I ignored them, but it was clear to me that he had a problem with video games. And so I told him that I was going to detox him from gaming while we sorted out school. I took him to the doctors to make sure he was healthy. He was diagnosed with very low vitamin D levels, I guess because he'd been in the dark for so long, and uh, severe anxiety and depression. He did not want to do medication, but he agreed to see a counselor. And so we started the detox process, and it was incredibly painful for him. He had headaches. It was difficult to get back on a regular sleep cycle. It was like going through jet lag for the next couple of weeks. He mourned the loss of his online friends because he wasn't making friends at university. He felt agitated. He felt more depressed. I got him exercising. I got him eating right, hoping that that would help elevate his mood. And he started counseling. During that time, we learned also that during first year, he'd also failed three courses. And so rather than him be two years behind in school, we decided together that after his eight weeks of counseling, he would go back for the second semester and he would pick up those three courses that he failed. And so we did. And I got that awful spidey sense once again uh, after I released him to his residence and I only heard once from him that week, it was at three o'clock in the afternoon on the Monday, and he said, survive day one. And then I didn't hear from him again. So that weekend, my husband and I drove back to the university to check on him. And when he opened the door, I realized immediately he'd relapsed again. It took some time for him to admit that. Um, but I said, if you want help, you need to be transparent with us. Otherwise, we can't help you. And so he was brought home once again, and we had a long discussion. And I asked him if he still wanted to be in university. Of course, he said he did, but he didn't think he had a gaming addiction. He thought he had a time management issue, and he thought gaming was just getting in the way of him getting his degree. So once again, I asked him what he needed. Sky's the limit. I will put my business on hold. I will do whatever you need. And he thought about it, and he said, I need you to drive me to school and walk me to class until I can do it on my own. If you leave me alone, I think I will still game. And so that's what I did. I did that for several weeks until he felt he could be on his own at school. Uh, and then he was required to send me photographs of himself in the lecture hall and in the classrooms to prove that he was actually attending. He had to come home on every weekend to be monitored. It was a long, hard process. It was a painful process. He relapsed many, many times. 
And then uh, two and a half years in, oh, before I finish, I did go to the university and get him some help. I did ask for him to see a counselor and um, he had a, a peer support person and he had a special needs advisor at the school. So he had extra support there. So I wasn't handling this totally on my own. He never did get addiction counseling. There wasn't a lot available in 2014 for video gaming addiction. Uh, and so he made use of the counseling at school. He worked through self-esteem issues and um, how to handle the program and um, how to manage his life um, in a healthier way. And uh, after two and a half years of relapse and detox, um, he finally came to the conclusion that video gaming was going to destroy his life, that he would have no opportunity to get a job once he got his degree. And so he made a commitment to stop gaming. That was six years ago uh, this summer. And um, he did, with a lot of help, get his degree in his fifth year of university. My husband and I sold our home and we moved to the city that his university was in so he could live with us and have a typical um, university year where he could join things on the weekends, uh, attend parties, make friends. Um, and create a new community rather than the online community that he had found solace in for all of those years. Uh, today, he is um, living on his own in Toronto. Uh, he is a software engineer. He's very successful with his work. He has found so many wonderful other activities to do to fill his life. He has lots of friends. He's still very close to his family. And I'm really proud of him. When he can, he sometimes um, speaks with me. And any time that he can help another person uh, overcome their addiction, he's really pleased. Thank you for sharing um, your experiences. This is very valuable uh, to hear. Um, very heartbreaking to hear as well, but I think valuable for um, for us, for the audience, for everyone to understand what it's like as a parent uh, to witness this in uh, one's uh, child. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, from a perhaps both personal and global perspective, it, it raises the, the question about ways in which we might prevent uh, screen addictions, uh, particularly to uh, video games with respect to guiding children, um, limiting uh, or restricting behaviors, as well as allowing them to have opportunities to grow and develop and be social in ways in which youth may connect. So I was wondering if you could share your thoughts about how we might best prevent the problems such as those that you've experienced with Jake? Yeah, that's such a great question. <laughs> it's the question all parents want to know. How do we not have this happen to us? And I think, first of all, for me, uh, to, to be emotionally available to your child, because the addiction is a symptom of something else that's going on in their life, something much deeper that's emotional. And I, of course, miss those cues. I didn't realize how much my son was struggling emotionally. And so we need to be, you know, very open-minded and non-judgmental and really listen to our children and understand what they're, they're going through in their lives. I think what's secondly most important is that we make sure our children have lots of other activities they're doing other than gaming and spending time on their phones. Uh, so many kids that I work with say, oh, I, I don't have anything else. I've never done anything other than play video games. And, and then that's difficult to find ways to fill those gaps when you are trying to um, stop the gaming addiction or the screen addiction. I think when you are in your home, you need to be setting um, timelines of when it's acceptable to be gaming and when it's not rules in the house about, you know, no phones at the table and no phones while we're playing, you know, games together or where we're, when we're um, having meals together. Um, and when your child is gaming, it's important that they have an activity that follows because it's so easy if they have nothing else to do for them to say, but I have nothing else to do. So I want to just keep gaming. And usually if we have a physical activity they can move to, that's even better because they've been sitting and they've been sedentary with their, their screens. 
allow your children to be bored, you know, that opens up the imagination for creativity. And, and we've become so used to being entertained by our digital devices that we don't like to sit and ruminate in our heads and be alone. And I think it's important that children learn that boredom is, is not a terrible thing, that you can, you can really be creative in, in your, your boredom. Um, and I think it's also really important for parents to model their own uh, screen use in the home because you know our children are watching us and they're paying very close attention to that. Um, yeah, I think if and also I think we need to be aware that children are spending money on games um, when they're online. And you know, don't give your children your credit card, first of all. And um, think about whether or not you think your child can handle a little bit of spending if they are purchasing things on a game um, and then uh, give them gift cards instead of uh, a credit card so that they can learn to budget and and have a, a specific amount that they're allowed to to use on a weekly or a monthly basis. No, yeah, thank you for, for sharing uh, those very helpful uh, comments and suggestions based on your experiences with Jake and um, your larger um, experience um, throughout this uh, process. Uh, I, another question that arises is if a parent has identified a child with a, a gaming addiction and has helped the child go through a detoxification, can there be healthy limits set later? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I never go hardcore detox for every child that has a problematic gaming issue. I generally start with the harm reduction where we just reduce the time and we try to introduce other activities in their life and maybe talk about what the issue is that's, you know, why they're numbing out with the gaming, why they're using it as an escapism. Um, and sometimes a detox is required to heal the brain for a little time. Uh, and then, yes, we can reintroduce gaming at a, a moderated amount afterwards, for sure. And one last question before we move on to the next presenter. Um, you had mentioned in your um, you, what you shared with us that um, you felt at one point that something may have been a bit off with Jake. Um, and that his behavior may have changed, or um, was there were there specific warning signs that you've identified now in hindsight uh, that you could share? Yeah, with for people? sure. Yeah, in in grade twelve, I started noticing he was fatigued a lot, and his grades started to slip. Uh, when he went off to university for the first year, uh, he wasn't uh, communicating a lot. If I did have to go pick him up for uh, an appointment or to come home for a, a holiday, I'd tell him I was going to arrive at two and then I'd get there and he wouldn't answer my text. And then I'd find him in his dorm room and it would be blacked out and he'd be sound asleep. So he was sleeping during the day uh, in second year uh, that and then summer between first and second year, he was gaming an enormous amount. And I approached him about it. And he became very angry with me. He said, you know, I'm in a co-op program and I just want this last summer to play because after this, I'm going to either be in school or I'm going to be working. And I didn't feel right about that either. Um, and then when he went into second year, I didn't hear from him hardly at all. And when I did see him, he did look like he'd been losing some weight. He he did have a body odor, but he seemed to always have an answer for everything. You know, second year is harder than first year. And, um, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll eat, mom. I'll find time to eat. And yeah, I'm, I'm answering your text at 3 a.m. because I'm up late doing an assignment. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll take a shower. But, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of time this year because it's so much harder. So that's why it was so easy for him to hide it from me because he seemed to just cover his tracks so well. Thank you for sharing what sounds like it was a really, really difficult experience and that you're now using that experience to share with people and to help others. So much appreciated. Thanks, Mark. And so we'll move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Naomi Feinberg, um, who is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Hertford. For sure, uh, and a consultant uh, psychiatrist at the Partnership University there and the NIH NHS uh, Foundation Trust, where she leads 
uh, the NHS England Highly Specialized Service for Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders. She currently chairs the World Psychiatric Association Anxiety and Obsessive Compulsive Disorders Scientific Section, coordinates the Horizon Europe Network for Problematic Usage of the Internet, and is secretary of the International College of Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Disorders. She is also editor-in-chief of Comprehensive Psychiatry. And today she's going to present on how to define and classify digital addiction and problematic internet uses, researching problematic internet use in children and adolescents. Thank you, Mark. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, children and screens. I'm going to talk a little bit about diagnosis and a little bit about research. So when we talk about problematic use of the internet, what do we really mean? Well, it's an umbrella term. It covers a lot of different behaviours that have become problematic in relation to internet or in relation to screens. And it ranges from gaming, pornography viewing, gambling, shopping and buying, video streaming, social media, cyberchondria, that's the online searching for medical information. And I don't think it will surprise you to know that there's still a critical scarcity of reliable scientific evidence or information on many key issues related to this, despite the impact it's having on society and on, on children and young people. So we don't know very much about the clinical boundaries of these problems. We're not entirely sure how they link up with addiction and with other mental health issues. We're starting to understand something about the brain-based biology and the socio-health economic impact. We still know very little about how to treat these problems when they arise, either to prevent them developing or to um, treat them once they're established. And in order to understand better some of these issues, we need reliable research, which in turn depends on standardized definitions of these disorders and standardized me measurement tools. So we all know when we're researching something, what it is we're measuring uh, and how. So we can, we can compare like with like. Now, when you look at the problematic internet use, behaviours, they do look very much like addiction in the main. So addiction coming from the Latin addicere, to be enslaved. And these are the cardinal features of addiction. First is impaired control. So you try to stop doing it and you can't. Strong craving and motivational preoccupations to do it. As a result of prioritising that behaviour, you neglect important other areas of your life, like sleep or your education or your work or your relationships. And you continue to engage, even though you know it's risky uh, and even though you know it's damaging you. Now, apart from gambling disorder, which can be an online disorder, we're much less certain as to whether the more physiological or biological features of tolerance, in other words, becoming desensitized to screen you, so you have to just use it more and more and more, or withdrawal, um, which is, is, is uh, very common in substance addictions and gambling, where you feel uh, moody, your sleep's disrupted, you're very agitated. It's less clear whether those symptoms of addiction occur across the broad range of internet use disorders. Um, not only that, but when you dig a bit deeper and look at some of these other disorders, aside from gambling and gaming, um, they don't they might look like other disorders, maybe more than addiction. So, for example, online shopping and buying or pornography viewing may be closer to impulse control disorders, where you get this irresistible urge to do it, even though you know it's going to be harmful later. Whereas checking emails or digital hoarding or the cyber searching all the time for health information or fitspiration, being obsessed with fitness and exercise, that's a bit closer to OCD, where you're doing it repetitively to avoid feeling bad or avoid bad consequences. 
And then excessive social media use uh, may be more linked to social anxiety disorder, where people feel more comfortable in online situations and they're avoiding in-person experiences. Or maybe related to this fear of missing out, the need to be up to date with absolutely nothing new for fear of, of, um, of shame and, and disgrace. So when it came to diagnosis, and, and Kate mentioned the World Health Organization and Mark's role in this, the World Health Organization is the international body responsible for the international standardization of disease classification and diagnosis. And the most up-to-date revision is the 11th revision of the International Classification of Disease, the ICD-11. Uh, and the World Health, World Health Organization grappled with uh, problematic use of the internet because um, in order to give a diagnosis um, they have to be sure that these entities really exist. Uh, their principle is based on the overarching public health need so that they would take the approach that a diagnosis would be reasonable if there's good evidence that in creating a new diagnosis it would prevent harm uh, either harm related to mental disorder or harm related to addiction. So uh, through uh, a great deal of consultation and discussion, um, they, uh, they took up the challenge of looking for diagnoses in the field of problematic use of the internet. They faced a number of controversies, um, a lot of questions about whether the scientific basis for diagnosis for these disorders, as they're so new, was strong enough. How did we differentiate them from, norm from normality? It was considered really important not to stigmatize non-problematic behaviors. But on the other hand, as I've said, the World Health Organization takes very seriously the importance of recognizing something if it really is a problem in order to be able to research and treat it. And as a result of all these discussions, they came up with these solutions. So we now have a new, brand new section the ICD-11 of disorders due to addictive behaviours, which, if you like, matches the disorders due to substances of addiction. And they gave two new disorders, diagnoses in this category, gambling disorder and gaming disorder. And there's a residual category as well for other disorders that, that may not, um, that are not gambling and gaming, but have the same uh, characteristics. They included the internet as a diagnostic specifier, so you can have online or offline gambling or gaming. And they included a new diagnosis called compulsive sexual behavior disorder that includes compulsive pornography viewing, which may occur online, which they didn't put with addictions, they put in the impulse control disorder section. And I thought I'd just show you the diagnosis for gaming disorder so that you can see what the behaviors that define this disorder are. So it's a persistent pattern of gaming that is characterized by all of the following. And principally, it's impaired control. Just as we've heard uh, talked about today, it's not being able to control starting, stopping the frequency and duration of the gaming. So it's not the amount of time you're gaming, it's whether you can control it or not that's key. And then the rest all falls out of that. Um, you're giving too much priority to gaming over other interests and activities. You continue to game or escalate gaming despite negative consequences. And it has to result in significant distress or impairment that's demonstrable in either personal, family or, or other areas of your life. And uh, if any of you are interested, um, as Mark mentioned, I chair uh, Horizon Europe, so European network uh, for problematic use of the internet. And there is this free uh, popular ebook available online that you can diagnose from our website, the www.internetme website, that covers all the other different forms of PUI, how to define them. Uh, and gives practical tips on how to manage them. So do feel free to, to download it. It's there to be used. It's also translated into other languages, including Spanish. 
I'd just like to finish with a couple of slides on some new research, because I've said there's very little information. So what are we doing about it? Well, you may be pleased to hear that the European Union has invested several million euros in this programme, which is called Bootstrap. Uh, and I'm privileged to lead this programme. It's based on the principles that healthy internet use is important for health and well-being, and that a subset of young people is harmed by internet use. So not everyone, but just a subset. And so we work with young people aged 20, uh, 12 to 16 years, their parents and their teachers, in order to find out who is most at risk and why that might be. And you can see in the little diagram that uh, you have the, the young person using the internet as a subgroup, depending on various factors, societal factors, their individual factors, a subgroup will shift to the problematic and, and mentally unwell category. So we want to know who these people are. And then we want to, to discover some harm prevention strategies, both at the level of the individual, so self-management techniques they can use to prevent harmful use, and then at the level of po politicians and policy makers to see if there are new social and health policies that we can introduce that makes it harder for, for at-risk young people to be addicted. Uh, and the idea is that this will boost mental health and well-being across Europe. So just to drill down into more detail of what we'll do, we're going to recruit several thousand teenagers via schools across Europe. We're going to use a bespoke app on their, on their phones to explore how they use the internet and to identify which behaviours, we're following them up over time, to identify which behaviours lead to harm. Then we're going to devise some strategies to tackle it. And we're going to test them in a randomised control trial uh, to see if we can identify self-management interventions young people can use themselves to prevent uh, these harms developing. At the same time, we're going to use the evidence that we've derived from the uh, assessments and observations to meet with politicians and see if we can develop some more rational policies about internet use. So we've put, sent our flyers out to schools. We're asking them to do, join the digital revolution uh, so that we can start recruiting. Uh, we'll actually recruit next July. So we're, we're in the process of interacting with the public about the design of the project. So I'd be very interested to hear your comments to make sure uh, that it is user friendly, particularly for parents and children. In summary then, healthy internet use Use is important for health and well-being. A subset of young people can be harmed. Some forms of problematic use, internet use involve loss of control and are recognised now as mental disorders. And this new research is going on, which I think is well placed to advance harm prevention and boost mental health and well-being amongst young people. So I'd just like to thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions and, and join this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feinberg. Um, we have time for one quick question now and we'll have more in the discussion. Um, but uh, you mentioned the Bootstrap Initiative. There's also the um, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study here in the United States. What would you um, see as the benefits or any concerns? And would you wish, for example, to have um, a teenage, if you had a teenage child, would you, what would your thoughts be about your child's participation in such a study? Well, that's a really good question, Mark. And that's something that, that we're grappling with, the research team are grappling with. The advantages of taking part in this research is a that you, that you're contributing, and it's for the first time really in these projects, uh, they're pioneering projects. We're we're contributing to new knowledge to understand uh, those personal factors in our children that might uh, render them vulnerable to problematic use, getting hooked on the internet. Uh, so on the face of it, it's a no brainer. Why, why wouldn't you get involved as you know, all of us have heard stories and are worried uh, that our young children you know, might be vulnerable. On the other hand, the nature of the research is very personal and involves careful scrutiny 
of individuals' internet use habits. And young children might not want to be uh, assessed in that way. Um, we, we view it as them donating their data, uh, but we will be monitoring their internet use no more than the, um, the uh, internet providers, Google, etc., already do on their mobile phones, but we will be transparently uh, looking to see what time they're on the internet at, how long they're on for, we won't be able to look at the content, but we're able to know what kinds of websites they're visiting. And people may feel that that's intrusive. Uh, and um, and also they may what they may alter their behavior. If they know that they're being assessed, they may alter their behavior as a result. We may not get an accurate um, representation. So I think people might be cautious. I think parents might be cautious if they think that their, ch that their child may be assessed and we might find a problem that they didn't know about and that suddenly becomes a problem that could feel a bit scary. So in this nine months that we have before we, we really gear up, we want to consult with parents and children to hear any concerns that they, they may have so that we make sure that when we, when we kick off the project, everyone's on side and everyone feels confident that this really is a good thing to be doing. Because I think without this kind of research, we're never going to really know those, those factors that, that determine uh, for illness. Thank you for that uh, very thoughtful um, response and for the important work that uh, you are uh, leading and conducting. So I'd like to move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Jason Nagata, who is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, where he is specializing in adolescent and young adult medicine. He researches health consequences of adolescent digital media use, and he has published over 250 articles in academic journals, and his research has been covered by national media, including the New York Times, NBC News, NPR, and CNN. He co-founded the International Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network, and he is the recipient of the American Academy of Pediatrics Emerging Leader in Adolescent Health Award and the International Association for Adolescent uh, Health Young Professionals Prize. Today, he'll be talking about um, some ABCD, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development uh, findings related to prevalence, predictors, and outcomes of problematic media use in adolescents. Thank you so much for having me and um, for covering this really critically important topic. Uh, as mentioned, I have been analyzing data from the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study um, over the last several years and wanted to share some of the findings related to problematic screen use from that study. Um, so overall, the objectives today are to describe the prevalence and sociodemographic associations, um, then prospective health associations, as well as parent media practices and those associations um, related to problematic screen use in young adolescents uh, who have participated in the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study in the US. So just as a little bit of background about the ABCD study um, in short, um, it's the largest long-term study of brain development and child health in the United States, um, which started in 2016 to 2018, which was baseline when the children were nine to 10 years old um, and occurred across 21 different study sites throughout the United States, representing all the different regions um, and followed about 12,875 uh, nine to 10 year olds with annual data collection. Um, the study measures problematic screen use, um, as well as mental health, physical health, uh, and a number of other um, related factors. Um, so just as a overview of the data collection and study design of the ABCD study, um, there are actually several different measures of screen use that have been collected, um, but specific measures of problematic screen use um, were started in the second year of the study when uh, the participants were about 11 to 12 years old, so still um, relatively young or early adolescents. Um, and then that, those questions have been continued um, subsequently. Uh, so the measures of problematic screen use that the ABCD study used um, were across three different modalities, um, video games, 
social media and mobile phone. Um, and for the video games, the video game addiction questionnaire was used. Um, this consisted of six questions that assessed problematic video game use, um, covering areas such as mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict, and relapse. And this was based on the Bergen Facebook addiction scale. Uh, and a very similar questionnaire was used for social media. Um, and then the mobile phone involvement questionnaire was eight questions that assessed problematic mobile phone use. So just as an example of some of the questions that were assessed and um, some of the frequency of responses, in terms of mobile phones, um, from this early adolescent sample, again, these are 11 to 12 years old at the time that they answered these questions. Um, among people who had mobile phones, about or nearly half said that they lost track of how much they're using their phone. 31% said that they interrupted whatever else they were doing whenever they were on their phone. 11% uh, said the thought of being without my phone makes me feel distressed. Uh, in terms of social media, um, 22.5% said that they spent a lot of time thinking about social media or planning use of social media apps. 18% uh, said that I use social media so I can forget about my problems. Almost 16% said they've tried to use social media apps less but can't. Uh, and then in the area of video games, uh, about 41% said I spend a lot of time thinking about playing video games. 21% said the need to play video games more and more. And 24% said, I play video games so I can forget about my problems. Um, and again, this is a, a large national sample of, uh, of young uh, adolescents. Um, overall, we also looked at general trends with um, socio-demographic factors that were associated with um, problematic screen use. Um, and we sort of assigned each participant an overall score for problematic use. Um, and then it did differ a little bit by modality. So overall, boys reported higher problematic video game usage, whereas girls reported higher problematic social media and mobile phone use. Um, there were also disparities by race ethnicity, um, where Native American, Black, and Latinx adolescents reported higher scores across all the problematic screen modalities um, compared to non-Latinx white adolescents. Uh, we also found that lesbian gay and bisexual Actual youth reported higher problematic screen use across all the measures. We then analyzed health outcomes one year after the initial reporting of problematic screen use. Um, so we looked at the problematic screen use when it was assessed at 11 to 12 years old, and then followed their mental health symptoms one year later when they were 12 to 13 years, controlling for their baseline mental health. Um, across the three modalities of phone use, social media, and problematic video game use. Um, problematic screen use was associated with depressive problems, attention deficit symptoms, oppositional defiant problems, uh, although effect sizes were generally small, um, and it was also associated with shorter sleep duration. We also found that problematic screen use was associated with suicidal behaviors, sleep disturbance, and substance use. In particular, problematic phone and social media use was associated with future marijuana, tobacco, and alcohol use. Finally, parents of adolescents in the ABCD study were also asked about their own media parenting practices, and we examined how these media parenting practices were associated with problematic uh, use in the adolescent. And overall, that we found that the greater parent screen use um, and parents um, allowing or having meals mealtime screen use or bedtime screen use was associated with um, greater problematic use across the different modalities. Um, and parental monitoring was associated with lower problematic social media and mobile phone use. Um, and parental restriction of screen use was associated with low, lower problematic use across the three modalities. Um, again, these are, again, with very young adolescents. So overall, from these studies, um, I do think that this supports some of the guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics to have potentially screen-free times like bedtime and family meals, to role model screen behavior, um, and to have restrictions um, and monitoring as appropriate. I just wanted to thank the participants and investigators from the ABCD study, as well as our lab team members um, and a number of funders. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagato.
Uh, we have time for a quick question. Um, ABCD is a longitudinal study, um, which will provide very important information. What do we know now about the long-term effects of different levels of screen media activity in children and adolescents as they go through development? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think one of the unanswered questions. We do have some preliminary data, as I showed, of some weaker associations between problem screen use at 11 to 12, um, and some mental health, um, shorter sleep, um, and substance use problems one year later. But um, this, I would say, uh, one of the hopeful um, promises of the ABCD study and other studies is that as they follow these you know, early teenagers through middle adolescence and later adolescence, even into young adulthood, we'll really be able to determine some of the longer term effects um, beyond even a year. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and sharing this important work. We'll move on to our next uh, presenter, who is uh, Dr. Clifford Sussman, who's been in private practice in psychiatry for children, adolescents, and young adults in Washington, D.C. since 2008. He is an expert on internet and video game addiction, whose work has been featured in the New York Times, HBO Re Real Sports, Parents Magazine, and Time Magazine for Kids. He also treats patients with comorbid conditions, such as ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. He is dedicated to helping people achieve a more balanced relationship with digital technology use. Today, he will be presenting on interventions and treatments for youth struggling with digital addictions and problematic uses of the internet, uh, and we'll be presenting on what caregivers should know. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Children and Screens for having me. Thanks for all these great presentations, and thank you, Dr. Potenza, for your excellent job as moderator. So I'm a child psychiatrist, and I really uh, focus on this in my clinical practice. I focus on uh, screen use related problems. And I see some of the most extreme cases in my, in my practice, but what I'm gonna try to do today in my limited time is focus in on my clinical perspective and some practical tips that all parents should hopefully be able to benefit from. So what you see here is a digital device. And what is it about digital devices that are so tempting to our kids? What is it that makes our kids prefer them so much over real life activities. You could see the digital device as a virtual shortcut machine because digital devices do a lot of the same things that we do in the real world. They give you virtual versions that are much faster. Uh, they, they give you, it's not that they give you better versions of what you want, it's that they give you what you want right away. So that's a really key concept. Because it turns out that, the, uh, that the, the reward system of the brain, these blue dopamine pathways. Now, dopamine is, is uh, the chemical that's released when we get what we want, when we want it. And dopamine release uh, is actually much more based on, uh, and that's the reward neurotransmitter, it's much more based on uh, the speed at which we get what we want than what we're actually getting. So we're on, uh, we're going to get that, not only are we getting what we want, but we're getting it quickly and continuously. And so once we're on our devices, it's unlikely that we're going to get off. But to get off, we need our brakes to kick in. Our brakes are in uh, the prefrontal cortex, where you see these red arrows. And unfortunately, in our teenagers and in our kids, their brakes are not as developed as uh, when they get older. So they're when you have underdeveloped breaks and you're on your screen, what can happen is that you just keep going and you don't get off. And uh, when you're on for long enough, that's when you start to have problems. But you're not just having problems because you're losing all the time to the screen. You're also having problems because when you finally do get off, you're still craving that dopamine, especially if you've been on for hours and hours and days and days. And so because these kids are still getting their dopamine, they may start to have a lot of these residual problems like irritability and you know going to all sorts of lengths to get back on their screen. Uh, they may um, 
you know, have, have defiance or aggression, uh, and they may have all sorts of different seeking behaviors, some of which have been described already. And so that's when you start to get problems for parents. Um, again, the problems from being on too long and the problems from the residual effects of being on too long. And so for parents, you want to be looking for, uh, you know, what, what the key definition of addiction is, which is described in our psychiatric manuals, actually, as use disorders. Uh, and it's been talked about already. Uh, but, you know, with addiction, you want to look for uh, the problems caused by the use, not just the use itself. So are there social problems? Are there academic problems? Are there health problems? And are there psychological problems? So what I try to do, um, you know, my approach to, to treating this and to dealing with it is uh, to try and not just uh, eliminate screen use altogether because that would, you know, be very impractical in today's day and age. I mean, we've gotten very dependent as a society on our digital technology for functioning. So what I do is really focus on trying to get a balance between what I refer to as high dopamine activity and low dopamine activity. And the goal of treatment is really to help my patients balance the two. So by high dopamine activity, what I'm talking about is activities that are instantly and continuously stimulating you, like uh, using, playing a video game or being on TikTok. Whereas a low dopamine activity could be activity that requires more patience. Uh, where we have to put more effort in to get what we want, where there's more delay in our gratification, such as doing homework or doing exercise or maybe uh, playing a musical instrument. And uh, the reason I don't just separate it into screen activities and non-screen activities is because you can actually do a low dopamine activity on a screen. Uh, you know, doing um, uh, uh, coding, for example, or making these PowerPoints could be a low dopamine activity that you do on a screen. The problem is if you're doing a lot of your low dopamine activity time on a screen, you're also gonna have all these other temptations on the screen. We are going to have such easy access to uh, you know, the internet and everything else that, that, that's at that device. And so it's kind of like drinking water in a bar. Now, that brings me to point I wanted to bring up, which is that your home kind of looks like this bar uh, to your kids if it's filled with devices and screens everywhere, uh, and, and if you're using your devices too. Uh, when um, And so that uh, the brain starts to release dopamine even before it gets what it wants from the cues that it's about to receive what it wants. So cues are a big factor. In fact, when someone with alcoholism walks into a bar, uh, they get all the sights, smells, and sounds of the bar, and that's what causes their brain to release dopamine before they've even had their first drink. So a lot of the work I do with uh, kids and families is about adjusting the cues in the house and trying to separate high dopamine cues from low dopamine cues. And so that's a big part of um, my strategy as well. Now, not only am I trying to help my patients uh, balance the high and low dopamine activities in terms of their time uh, and their schedule, I'm also trying to help parents balance their approach to how to deal with this problem. Because I find that um, you know parents have trouble finding a balance between knowing what limits to set and what sort of natural consequences to put in place. And encouraging their kids to self-regulate and be more independent and set their own limits. And I find that some parents will settle into one extreme approach or another sometimes because maybe it's more comfortable for them. Like for example, during the, the, um, the lockdowns, during the pandemic, a lot of parents just sort of gave up completely on trying to set limits. So you could see this sort of extreme of just not setting any screen time limits at all you could see it as enabling because a lot of these parents are the ones who, you know, when their kids are uh, missing many days of school or uh, uh, not turning in any assignments, maybe they'll be covering for them. So you could see that as 
excuse me, you could see that extreme as sort of an enabling approach, whereas you could see the extreme of uh, limit setting, you know, as the parents who try to control and regulate everything, almost like the screen police. So you could see that as micromanaging. And so really what I'm trying to help parents do is find a balance. And maybe as their kids go from younger to older teenagers, I'm, I'm trying to help them, uh, you know, go start out with more limit setting and go gradually towards more self-regulation. Because even if you can police and micromanage your kids perfectly to the point where, you know, maybe they get into this awesome college, uh, then, you know, what happens when they're there and they basically have you there to micromanage them? And, you know, you, you could uh, maybe hear a little bit of that in, in Elaine's story. Uh, and in fact, in my practice, even before the pandemic, I was getting a lot of patients who were college, first year college dropouts who just didn't know how to handle the lack of structure and the lack of guidance. So this is just a little bit of like the tip of the iceberg. I do a lot more specific interventions and treatments with my patients, but you know, in the time we had, I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the things that that I've learned uh, for that are helpful for parents. You can find a lot more resources uh, on my website, cliffordsustinmd.com. If you click on the link, Internet and Video Game Addiction Information, you'll have access to a lot of uh, free videos and podcasts and other information. So, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um very helpful presentation of your clinical experience. And this is, I think, of interest to many people. And oftentimes, um, youth with uh, problematic use of the internet may have other uh, concerns uh, going on. We heard from Elaine about perhaps um, affective conditions like depression, uh, but also a number of parents and um, individuals have reported other concerns like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and antisocial uh, and um, autism spectrum disorder, and was wondering uh, with children with these different needs and a variety of different presentations, how do you best help uh, youth manage a digital environment? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. There's all sorts of um, differences in kids and parents may have to adjust that balance that I was talking about based on their, those differences. So um, one of the examples you brought up was autism and I work with a lot of kids in the autism spectrum in my practice. So, um, you know, and, and they perhaps may need, may not be as independent as other kids, uh, as neuro, uh, neurotypical kids of the same age. So they may need uh, some more limit setting, but one, one thing I think in general, just to know about, um, you know, kids who aren't neurotypical and ADHD kids as well, is that some of the standard interventions that I endorse for parents, such as additional structure, uh, uh, having good routines, um, having uh, uh, a schedule, like a very specific schedule, and doing things like that are are they, they're even better and more for kids with things like ADHD and autism. And with kids in the spectrum, one of the keys is that they really want things, they tend to really want things to be predictable. They really want to know what's happening. And so a great way to prevent power struggles and aggression and all sorts of issues is to really let them know ahead of time, uh, not only what their schedule is, but exactly how much time they're going to get on the screen uh, to let them know exactly what the consequences will be if they don't get off when it's time. To a, so the more predictable things are to them, the better. Sometimes even a five-minute warning uh, prior to, the, to a block ending can prevent um, aggression or a power struggle. So these are some of the interventions that are really good for autism. And I think that also just preventing power struggles in general is really key. Uh, so sometimes you just have to avoid them if... Uh, you know, you just have to wait until things calm down to be safe. Yes, and preventing these um, occurrences is really important as a lot of parents 
um, struggle, uh, particularly with youth uh, with autism spectrum disorder, but also individuals without, um, may become upset, uh, perhaps escalating into violence and aggression. Um, so in addition to trying to prevent, are there ways of de-escalating once, um, a, say, a power struggle becomes more um, severe? Well, a, a general rule of thumb for de-escalating is to um, try to see if, if, if you can avoid all physical uh, types of interventions and just, you know, sometimes you just have to uh, get away until the risk of aggression has, has subsided. Um, but, you know, I may need to work with families on very specific types of approaches for de-escalation. Um, you know, sometimes there's there's medication options as well that can prevent those escalations from happening in the first place. Other times there's therapeutic options um, that can that can help, uh, you know, individual psychotherapies. Um, but, you know, there's there's. A, again, the more the more that they know what's going to happen um, and the more that you that parents have sort of prepared and planned for these things. I think one of the main things for parents is just to kind of know that it comes with the territory and kind of, you know, almost anticipate it. Uh, and so they, they've got a bunch of strategies in place to use already. That sounds very helpful. And, and so delighted that we have this whole panel here um, uh, of experts looking at the, the uh, concerns from different perspectives. And so I'd like to bring some questions from the audience to the group. Um, so one of the, the questions is, uh, how can parents or youth find uh, help when they realize that there is a problem? What programs exist? And how do individuals know when it's time to seek professional help? So I'll put that out to the, the panel. And maybe I'll direct that to you, Dr. Sussman. Well, with as far as seeking professional help, um, I mean, I, I think that, you, again, you want to look at how, just how dysfunctional uh, the behaviors have become, uh, you know, what, what's, what's happening to them across the board in terms of the problems it's causing. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult because you have to uh, make sure that even kids who don't say they have a problem or don't admit they have a problem or in denial, uh, still get the help they need. So sometimes it's, you know, it's better to err on the side of, of seeking help. It's very standard for kids to be ambivalent about it. And in fact, pe all people with any types of uh, compulsive use problems tend to be ambivalent, which means there's a part of them that kind of knows they're having a problem, but another part that really wants to keep doing what the problem is. Uh, that really wants to keep using screens heavily. So it's, you know, it's very typical for parents to get resistance when they're trying to get help. Uh, but, you know, again, if you're, if you're having these types of problems, I think it really is important to, to call a professional, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist to try to schedule um, an intake appointment if, if you can't do it uh, with the information you have by yourself. Elaine, might I direct the same question to you? Because I think you've lived through the experiences of your son, perhaps not um, immediately being open to seek treatment, even though you felt like it may have been helpful uh, to him. Yeah, in my case, uh, there wasn't a lot of help available at that time <laughs> in terms of video gaming addiction. Um, I mean, the most difficult thing about addiction is that those who are addicted will isolate and, you know, they don't want to be around the people that are going to tell them it's bad for them or that it's not good. So they can, you know, hang on to that um, need for a fix and get it. And, and the most difficult thing about video gaming addiction is that even if they isolate from you, they still have this built in online community that they communicate with. So they don't feel isolated whatsoever. 
And that was a big problem for Jake. Uh, and so building new community outside of online gaming was probably the most important step for him so that he could realize that he could leave his room, he could spend time with people, and it could be just as meaningful as it was online. I mean, we have to be careful not to be calling these online friends not real. I hear that from a lot of parents, that that's not their real friends. But to these children, those are their real friends. Uh, my son was bullied in middle school, and so he gravitated to online gaming to find community and feel accepted and, and be with children that, you know, were like him. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of them were all, you know, emotionally in trouble as well. So that wasn't particularly helpful. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it always starts in the home and, and creating better communication uh, if you want to reach your gamer. Uh, you know, they tend, I hear things like they don't want to eat at the table with us. You know, they take their, their food to their console to eat. And that's generally because every time they come to the table, you want to address the problematic gaming. And so if you want to, you know, build that alliance with your child again, stop talking about the problem and then just start having light, you know, interesting conversation and, and get to learn, you know, what they're struggling with and who they are. Um you know, there, there are lots of, um, you know, therapists to, to take your children to, and you don't necessarily have to go with the problematic gaming. You can just start working on whatever the core issue is first. And then, you know, maybe that becomes a, a point of discussion. That's certainly what happened with Jake is as long as he was able to speak to the counselor at school about, you know, his self-esteem issues and, and, you know, the bullying uh, past history and the fact that he just really felt small at school. You know, he was a gifted kid in a, in a, a program with very few other children. And so he felt like a big fish in a small pond. And he got to university and discovered there's lots of smart kids. And he suddenly felt like a tadpole <laughs> in an ocean. And it really uh, severed his um, ability to feel he could handle the program as well. And so that was one of the other reasons that he gravitated to gaming. So we just have to be really aware of what's going on for our kids first and try to reach them in that way, I think. I often tell parents, you just sort of plant seeds and talk to your kids about what you miss. You know, what are you missing now that they're locked in their rooms? And, you know, you don't necessarily have to say if you weren't gaming, uh, you know, we could be spending more time together. But you can say, you know, I, I miss our times together and I, I miss seeing you light up when when we go out together. Um, and that's, you, know, that's Lane, you, make a, you make a really good point about, you know, when you're addressing your kids behaviors, how they, you know, if you try to just sort of take it head on and attack directly, they may just sort of run the other way. And that's the nature of ambivalence. And it's why it's much better if you can get a kid to tell you what problems they're having uh, than you telling them what problems they're having and what they need to do, because they're often going to do the opposite of what they feel an authority figure is telling them to do. And so in, in my therapy, a lot, I'll use a motivational interviewing approach where, you know, I try to have kids become their own authority figure. And I try to just really listen and be reflective and try to really hear what's going on and what problems they're having. Um, to try and give them more insight. Thank you both for that. And uh, that practical information and the clinical approach information is really helpful to hear. And I was curious um, with uh, what you were sharing, um, Dr. Feinberg, you had mentioned the learning how to deal with problematic usage of the internet e-booklet that was generated through the cost initiative. And I believe that booklet has a number of practical pieces of information or practical approaches that people can use. Maybe you could share with us some of that information. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, absolutely. So um, do feel free to download it. I'm, I'm sure Kate and the team will, will send the link. Um, there are the sort of generic issues um, and generic approaches that, that we've been talking about that, that we discuss in the book, which is around, you know, I, I, and I loved um, Dr. Sussman's description of the need for balance. It, it's about, there's a great emphasis on balance and so making sure that, that your lifestyle is well balanced with your children, that there's plenty of social interaction and exercise and all those other things going on. 
as well as uh, allowing screen time, um, but within in, in, in reasonable limits. Um, and uh, it, it may be quite appropriate to set some rules in the household, as, as we've discussed about, you know, not having your mobile phones on at the table through negotiation uh, and discussion. But, but the key, again, as, as uh, Dr. Sussman and Elaine were saying, I think the key is, is for, for parents, as we say in the book, for parents and children to be communicating with one another, that parents need to understand what's going on on the internet. They need to understand these games. Very often we don't, but we need, we need to put some effort in. We need to find out what these games are. We can talk about them with our children so that they become an interactive uh, activity rather than an isolatory activity. And then we talk more specifically, if you think your child is starting to run into problems, then, you know, with the limit setting, taking the point that, that Dr. Sussman says about being predictable, not just um, impulsively uh, instituting a rule, explaining in advance why and what what you're you're trying to do, but also if you know the game, having a dialogue with the child. If they're playing a game that's really important that they finish a certain game and they're on it with all their friends across the world, and if you make them stop in the middle of the game, that's just never that's never going to work. Yeah, negotiate that with with your child and let them get to the end of the game before stopping. Um, and similar um, interactions like that, um, and, and trying to as I say, trying to diffuse the tension, and it's going to involve compromise. Uh, but the more the parents can be involved, and, and again, we emphasise very strongly, as Dr Sussman says, modelling parents' behaviour. If you're on your mobile phone at the table or when you're talking to your child, you know, you can't be surprised if they're going to uh, prioritise that behaviour as well. So try and, and practice what you preach. So those are some of the tips that, that we offer on, on, the, um, on, on the book. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. Dr. Nagata, your thoughts, particularly with respect to how to make a family media use plan? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, the American Academy of Pediatrics also has a helpful resource um, on family media use plans. And um, it very much echoes all the discussion that we've had, but there are different areas and it's an online kind of interactive tool. Um, so just highlighting what everyone has said, like, I think there's not a one size fits all solution for every family, for every child. And so this sort of goes through the different domains about like having a discussion with your child, you know, potentially having screen free times like bedtime meals, screen free zones, maybe in bedrooms or bathrooms, digital privacy and safety, um, and then balancing, you know, media time with other, you know, physical activity and uh, other activities. Um, so it just has all of those things laid out and I think can be a helpful re resource. Um, and I would also just um, encourage if you are <laughs> having any concerns, um, you know, one person you could talk to um, is like your pediatrician or primary care doctor as sort of a first step. Oftentimes, they are supposed to be assessing for media use um, in like, well, child checks or, or physical exams. Um, but if you have any concerns, I think that could be a good place to start. Um, and they may be able to make initial referrals. I'd like to uh, make a comment on what you were talking about with the family use plan. A family media use plan is that um, I think if you're going to use a tool like that, uh, one thing I caution parents about is not using it like some kind of contract where if it's broken, you failed as a parent. Uh, rules are are going to be broken. That's something you have to understand as a parent, and you know you have to kind of when you put in place a plan, you can have you can set up rewards for following the rules. You can set up you know very reasonable logical consequences for breaking them. Uh, so it doesn't have to be like a contract. It can just be like, these are the house rules uh, that we follow. And this is what happens if you, if you follow them. And this is what happens if you break them. Thank you. And thank you for all the useful information uh, from uh, all the panelists. Uh, one question that comes to mind is, um, we're still at a stage of understanding and initiatives like ABCD or Bootstrap are going to be really helpful for understanding relationships 
between types and patterns of screen media activity and concerns that may arise, um, as well as uh, potential benefits um, from utilizing screen media. Um, one question that arises is that ABCD starts at nine to 10 years old, uh, Bootstrap starts at 12 years of age, but youth are beginning to interact with digital media at increasingly earlier ages and getting smartphones in higher proportions at earlier ages. So what are the thoughts uh, about early childhood development and patterns of screen media activity? What can parents do um, as their uh, children at are, are at earlier stages than say ABCD or um, Bootstrap may cover? And I'll ask Dr. Nagata or Feinberg to begin since I framed this within <laughs> ABCD and Bootstrap. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really great question. And I do think that part of this <clears throat> lack, ability, like, lack of one size fits all solution is that, uh, you know, they, as kids develop, like there's so, so many rapid changes, like obviously a one-year-old is going to be different than a five-year-old is going to be different than a 10-year-old. Um, and you have to have very different types of rules and perhaps more concrete rules, especially for the younger ages. Um, so I do think that you really have to take into account developmental stage and appropriateness. Um, I'll just highlight that the current American Academy of Media Pediatrics um, media use guidelines, and again, you know, <clears throat> they may not be like hard and fast, but their general guidance is that for under 18 to 24 months that you actually avoid digital media use altogether, unless it's for like video chatting or interactive kind of calls, um, like with grandparents or other family members. Um, and then for 18 to 24 months, if you are going to introduce digital media to really just choose high quality programming like PBS Kids or, you know, something that's really geared towards educational content for children and while, as, while avoiding, you know, maybe more fast paced um, programming or social media and stuff like that. Um, then from two to five year olds, they recommend limiting to under an hour again of high quality use. Um, and then above five, there actually is no, uh, there are no like specific time guidelines. They used to recommend less than two hours a day, but um, since so many kids, uh, so many children now you get more than that. And there's so many different contexts that has sort of been abandoned for this family media use plan, which is to make it a little bit more individualized for your household. Um, but I do think it's really complicated. And as you mentioned, like kids are exposed to screens at very early ages now. Um, and to some extent, you can't completely avoid them. Um, but I, I do think that taking into account developmental appropriateness is very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagata. Dr. Feinberg. Yes, I, I agree with everything that you said, Jason, that that all makes sense. Um, the difficulty in, in investigating very young children is that the models for investigating the children, because as, as Dr. Nagata has said, the brain is at a different developmental stage. So the instruments that we use to measure uh, developmental functioning, um, how people are manipulating information, mood states and so on, changes hugely as you go through childhood into adolescence. And the, and the tools that we have, the limited tools that we have at the moment are really geared towards older children, adolescents and adults. And so we don't really have the instruments available to um, measure very young children and the effects of internet on them in, in a very reliable way. Um, it's also harder to um, conduct research in younger children. It's just more difficult practically to do. We When we devised the bootstrap, we were wondering how low we should go in terms of age. And we settled on the age of 12 because everybody would be in a second, in Europe, we call it a secondary school. Maybe you call it the high school in America. So it'd be easier to get the children. Uh, it would be easy to work with the, with the teachers. They'd have more autonomy. Uh, and the me brain mechanisms were relatively developed to a certain level that we could make some predictions, whereas um, we're much less able to do so in the younger age group. Having said so, 
a, a lot of the research in the younger group relies, a lot of it relies on parental reports as to how their children are doing at the ages of one, two, three and four. Um, just to say that there is some new research that's just come out from Japan, I think, <clears throat> Japan, which did seem to show that uh, screen time at the age of one year old uh, did equate with some developmental changes at the ages of two, three and four years old. Now, that's not to say cause and effect. It's not to say the more screen time you have at the age of one, the poorer your development in very specific areas, not across the board, but but particularly um, in 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 inhibitory in be, in be able to stop things. Um, but it, it did seem to hint that controlling that that the um, American Pediatric Association guidelines make make a great deal of sense, and that. Um, children at a very young age are not immune to these problems. And if they spend too long on the internet, may have some developmental problems in, in later early childhood. But these are still very preliminary results. Um, I think we need to crack how we research that in the next few years. Yes, and I think... I could, this, sorry, I was, I was just going to add like some practical sides to this. Uh, I think we were talking about the, the devices as a virtual shortcut machine, and I think parents should be asking themselves, like, what shortcuts are we getting from the machine? Are we using it as a virtual babysitter? Um, are babysitters using it as a virtual babysitter? You know, are we um, using it to help distract our babies while we feed them? You know, there's so many apps and so, so many uh apps on our devices that are designed to get the very youngest and, and most vulnerable. Uh, you, you see really little kids endlessly watching YouTube videos of people opening chocolate eggs. And you're like, how could they be watching that? Well, you know, they, they're getting similar types of reinforcement that a gambler gets when they're online gambling or playing a video game for that matter. Yeah, so I, I think that this um, bridge between science and how do we take the science and translate it into um, practical, useful, health-promoting information is still an active area um, and is moving into earlier stages of development. Um, and I, there's a new uh, study uh, called the um, Healthy... Um, brain child development uh, study, HBCD, which is starting at earlier ages than ABCD. And um, I've encouraged um, some of the leaders of that initiative to include screen media activity measures um, in the developing children so that we can understand brain behavior relationships um, over, over time, which I think um, will help us address this knowledge gap in this rapidly changing environment. Um, what I'd like to do is to, um, even though um, I would like to continue at this uh, discussion, this very important dialogue, we are running short of time. So I'd like to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists uh, for a really complementary group of presentations that um, synergistically covered this very important uh, topic. Um, so thank you all for bringing your um, areas of expertise and your experience and uh, thoughts and knowledge uh, together and sharing uh, this information with uh, the larger group of people um, uh, viewing this uh, online presently and uh, perhaps uh, down the road as well. So I'd like to turn things over to um, our uh, organizers. Thank you, Mark. And before we close, I want to thank all of our panelists today for those informative presentations and the enlightening discussion. Thank you also to our Zoom audience for attending this session and to learn more about digital media and child development or the work of the Institute, check out our website at childrenscreens.com. Follow us on these platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will be taking a brief season hiatus in the month of September as we host the Digital Media and Developing Minds International Scientific Congress in Washington, DC. 
We hope you will join us when ask when the Ask the Experts webinars resume on Wednesday, October 4th with anxiety, youth mental health, and digital media. This will be the first of a two-part series addressing the current youth mental health epidemic and the relationship with technology and digital media use. Thank you.